Hello and welcome to Raise Your Average. I'm Pierre Daly, Managing Editor at AdvisorAnalyst.com. Co-hosting with me is Rodrigo Gordillo, President at Resolve Asset Management Global. David Burroughs, President and Chief Investment Strategist at Barometer Capital Management, is our guest. David provides the Barometer team with macro-driven quantitative analysis covering mobile markets and asset classes. Barometer tactically manages investment portfolios targeting structural revaluations. David co-founded Barometer Capital Management in 1991 after beginning his career in 1986 with the private client group at Scotia McLeod. With Greg Gishon, David sits on the firm's investment policy committee and is responsible for the overall construction and daily review of all client portfolios. David's a frequent guest as a market commentator on CTV, CBC, and BNN Bloomberg. Barometer manages discretionary investment portfolios for private investors, foundations, and endowment funds. Their stated purpose is to earn consistent, absolute returns while preserving capital. The views and opinions expressed in this broadcast are those of the individual guests and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AdvisorAnalyst.com or of our guests. This broadcast is meant to be for informational purposes only. Nothing discussed in this broadcast is intended to be considered as advice. David, welcome to the show and thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to have you. So much to talk about today. Uh, such a, a pivotal moment in uh, 2022 to be having this conversation. How are you? I'm, I'm very well and, and thanks so much for having me. You're, you're absolutely right. It is, a, it is a pivotal time in, in 2022 and, and frankly, sort of in the longer term constructs of things. And it's a, it's a tricky time, I think, for investors because there's a lot of mixed messages and, and conflict with what they know. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I really like about your approach, David, is that you, you're really not married to, to any uh, particular direction in the market and you're, you're, you're willing to, uh, you're willing to pivot <laughs> or to turn on a dime. <laughs> Uh, if things change and, and the way in the way that you've got your portfolio structured, probably the best place to start, David, is if you could uh, tell us about the arc of your career and um, how you got started in the business in the first place and how you got to, you know, how you got to founding Barometer and, and what you're up to these days. Sure. So, Pierre, it's, it's interesting. Like we all have our start somewhere. And, uh, and I always was in the business of, of, of helping families take care of their the money that they made over time and, and, you know, realized nobody was trying to use us to get wealthy. They wanted to make sure they didn't give it back. And, and that was just the first place to start. If you put, you know, 10 of your best clients around the table, uh, the number one thing they cared about was what you were going to do to protect them against making a big mistake. And, and that's, and that's really quite different than, than other types of investors. You know, uh, uh, you get hired to run a pension portfolio. Uh, your job is to generate a return relative to whatever that benchmark is. And, uh, and you don't deviate too far because being different than the benchmark means you're higher risk. <laughs> uh, and, and, a, you know, private client doesn't think of things that way. So, um, it was interesting early on, you know, the banks were not in the investment business, uh, and they all bought investment dealers and one by one built platforms to offer investment management services. And they said, well, we'll go out and find the best quality institutional managers we can find to run your money. And it just assumed that the client was looking for that same outcome. And, um, you know, the reality is a private investor, high net worth person, you know, really wants to know how much can you make me north of zero. Uh, and they're just fine being out of the market at certain points in time or avoiding big groups. And, um, and so, you know, we set about building process around trying to deliver that. And uh, it, it's made us a bit odd at times, uh, but the, the reality, you just can't ever forget that. And you get into a time like now, and it's probably never been as important to look on like the market. Um, so yeah. anyway, we, we, we kicked off the, the, the firm in 1991 and, you know, of course it's gone through iterations over time. And, uh, but, uh, you know, we have a lot of the same clients we started with and, and, uh, good long, got long relationships. David, in your long career, because we met when I first started the business back in 2006, so you already 
had gone through a period that was very interesting uh, in, in the global landscape that is reminiscent somewhat of where we are today, possibly for a short period of time. And then we kind of went back to this kind of uh, abundant liquidity, persistent growth and, uh, and um, uh, benign inflation period. But that, that mid not period seemed to be a pretty fantastic time for active management. And we kind of struggled a bit you know, I would say the last 10 years, have you put any thought into, as you, as you, as you go through your journey, have you put any thought into, as to what went right there and what's been difficult in the last 10 years and what do you see happening from here for active? Yeah. You know, I mean, look at where you, you realize that market cycles, uh, are a lot longer when you think of them in human terms. Uh, because you know, what seems like a long time, isn't a long time in the market. And so we go through these big waves and, and, you know, I've been fortunate. I I've always been interested in history and I've always been interested in understanding the things that have happened in the past. I think the more you understand about what has happened, the more you understand what can happen. And, uh, and that was a, that was a very interesting time. We'd been through this great secular bull market with tons of liquidity and, 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 you know, the reality is things got overcooked and people got on one side of the market and those things have a tendency to revert to a mean, but it takes longer than, than people think. One of the greatest comments I ever heard was that there is a long way between where a momentum investor stops buying and where a value investor steps in. <laughs> and, and that's either a lot of time or a lot of price movement, one of the two. And so. I think that it's, it's important at that time, if you think about it, people had spent their whole investing lives through the eighties and nineties, knowing a, a hurricane tailwind and, and the, the dumbest thing you could ever do was to sell, to sell an investment, you know, the old, the old saying by somebody buy, hold and prosper. And I remember thinking, which, you know, somebody's got up and say, got to get up and say, there could be a long period of time where that just is not going to work you know, like the period from 1966 to 82. So that, that's kind of where we got our start spending a lot of time talking to people about selling strategy, how to make sure a little mistake didn't turn into a big mistake, uh, and understanding that you could go through a long period of time with a micro market cycle and you can make money, but you have to, you know, kind of pick your spots. And I think, I think in some ways we're in a similar time where investors have to not rely on everything they've learned in the last 20 or 30 years, because that might get them into a lot of difficulty. So there's a lot yeah. of similarities in that way. I like to say, I'm saying these days more, more and more that we shouldn't confuse experience with expertise, <laughs> right? Cause yeah. experience right now, it, it gives you an intuition that might be dead wrong. Yeah. Given that the last 40 years, really, we've been in a, disinflationary growth environment. And in that environment, we know from, as you say, David, studying history, that the assets that tend to do really well is a buy and hold equity, developed equity, developed bond portfolio. But nobody's really lived through the period prior to 1981, or very few professional investors have. And that's mm -hmm. why I say ex expertise is those that are willing to go back in time and prepare for those types of regimes. And I think it's really difficult for people to not think, hey, this is another B recovery. We're off to the races again, inflation back to 2%. I think it's a, it's a crucial thing to really study history. I know, you know, you were one of the first people to point out to me the 70s. Um, and I've even gone back to the 40s and the 20s. It's, it's going to be, a, it already is a quite a different world. Um, but when do you think we hit that new regime and, and how long do you think that lasts? Well, you know, I think that we're in it. And, it. and I mean, in some ways, I actually think the world started to shift uh, in 2018. But, you know, if you look at regime changes, they tend to be a bumpy ride. You know, that's not, it's not from a Friday to a Monday morning and they unfold over a period of, of years. And I think 2020 interrupted it again. Um, and and then here we are, you know, since then, some pretty clear signs that the regime changed, you know, like the, the shift in long-term rates that is virtually impossible to ignore at this point. Uh, the change in relative performance of commodities, say, to equities, uh, which endured a very long bear market up to that point. 
Um, but you know, as I like to say, even in a secular bull market, you have some pretty bumpy periods and some reversion to the mean. And so I think that that's the, that's the trickiest thing for investors. Cause that can be, you know, you know, several months at a time where you really might question your resolve and you, and you have to be tactical around that. So, uh, it's, it's interesting. I was, I was in New York last week and, and, uh, had the opportunity to hear one of my favorites speak, Stanley Druckenmiller. And, you know, he said, look, he said, this is probably the most uncertain moment since 1982 when this, this whole thing started. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things you have to consider as an investor today. And, uh, one of the most important things will be the ability to, to, to reposition from time to time as we go through the bumps of, a of a transition. It's, it's amazing how quickly change, uh, how quickly things changed in, in two weeks, uh, since the end of August, uh, you know, we had the large market breadth run, run up from mid June to the end of August. Then the Jackson hole meeting just came along and dashed all the markets dovish hopes. Um, what do you make of that, David? You know, look, you were in a period where, um, there is some very consensus positioning. And, um, so when you have consensus like that, small data points can make a big difference. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of people who believe, as you said, that, you know, inflation will roll over and we'll, we'll go back to a growth regime and the old leadership will resume. And that's great for indices because they're a big part of the index and great for passive investors because they're all there already. And I saw some data, I'm sure you did too, that, that hedge funds are, are more crowded into the small number of names than they were a year ago. Uh, even though, you know, I'd point out that while they bounced in that, uh, June, July period, uh, the relative strength disappeared the second the market rolled over. Yeah. Um, and I, that's always to me a big sign, you know, but so I, I think, I think that, um, you know, at some point the fed will pivot somewhat, uh, but my guess is that some of these inflation forces will be much more sticky than people expect. And it might not, it might not be the supply chain issues that people have thought about, but, you know, structurally in some of the commodities, there are just shortages and in inventories and ability to supply. And that's not, that's not going away. You know, you, the Fed can't fix the energy situation. They can't fix the metal situation. And so in some ways, uh, you know, there's a lot of repositioning still to happen. And so that, um, let's talk about that sticky inflation, because we can talk about inflation remaining secularly high, but, uh, yeah. uh, cyclically, we seem to be coming off a very big high. Uh, yeah. have you, have you put any thought into where the bottom of that inflation, uh, that CPI number might be? Well, look, I mean, yeah, the, the, the CPI is going to come down somewhat, uh, you know, there's the, the different components are not moving at the same time. Um, but you have to be a little bit concerned that, you know, if you go back to the seventies and I'm not, I don't, I don't think we're in the seventies right now, uh, because I think it's too early in the shift to, to an inflationary regime, but, but, you know, uh, energy prices ultimately did turn into wage inflation and that, and that didn't go away quickly. So. Uh, I, I think that, I think that there are components. I do think the the fed is smart in their rhetoric because they're using their bully pulpit to the greatest ability to try and say, Hey, you may not want to consume quite so much because it's going to get tougher from here. Um, uh, I think they're trying to get the maximum impact out of front loading to get, have impact on demand without really hurting the underlying fundamentals in the economy. And that's, it's gonna be a very tricky, tricky go. The soft, the famous soft landing. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The famous soft landing. Well, well, you know, I mean, you, the same thing, look at the front loading that's happening with, with, uh, Bank of Canada too, right? It's, yeah. uh, you know, massive, uh, unexpectedly large hike, or uh, maybe it wasn't unexpected, but certainly not wanted anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's absolutely true. But. Uh, 
I think that the playbook that a lot of people are using may be somehow flawed. So for instance, um, when you go through a decline, like we did through the course of the winter, you know, eventually they do come back generally, if it's a big enough decline and get the, get the leadership. And of course in, in April and May, they, they crack the commodity complex and it sold off sharply. And my guess is that was really led by financial players saying, Hey, how do we manage through this? We should probably be short some of this stuff. Um, but having said that the moment the market made a turn in June, you know, all of the basic materials complex took off and regained a whole pile of relative strength versus the market. And when the fed, you know, came out and said, no, no, hold on. Not so fast. We, we got more hikes to come, you know, and everything sold off in, in August, actually the relative performance of, of commodities was not so bad, actually, mm -hmm. you know, I think that if you look at it from the, from the recent high to today, the Rogers commodities index off about 2%. I think the S and P off about six and the NASDAQ off 11, 12. So, you know, I always think it's interesting to see when the market sells off, what is it that, uh, holds its gains? So, so when you get a bounce, we all care about what bounces, but we know there's a combination of short covering and there's a combination of real buyers. When you get that first pullback, what is it that holds up? What is it that gives it all back? And maybe the market's wrong. I just have never assumed that. Generally, market gets it right. So I really care about that stuff. And I can see the case for the fact that, you know, a Fed that tightens longer could have a bigger impact on the economy. And that in the playbook of the last 30 or 40 years, that's going to have a big impact on commodities, for instance. But we might not be in the same playbook. And structurally, the picture is different. The inventories are different. The, the constraints on supply are different. And it's, it strikes me that, um, you know, these are very inexpensive assets and it's going to take more than this to, to change that structural picture. Um, on the other hand, everybody's long, you know, long duration assets and, uh, they aren't showing any real relative strength. If you really thought there was a bunch of economic weakness coming, you probably, we wouldn't see the 30 year, 30 year yield today, make a new high, which it did, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a very interesting time and, and people are really going to have to look to the market for guidance because, you know, hoping the market does what you want it to do may, might not be the answer. Yeah. The hope is never an investment strategy. <laughs> yeah. No. And I think I remember the day Jackson hole, uh, markets down three and a half percent energies were up three and a half percent to five, depending on that. So that was an interesting tall tell sign of, okay, we are still heading in that kind of direction that we've been seeing for the whole year, which is equities mm -hmm. down bonds seem to be kind of flailing. And then you have commodities, relative strength holding up, right? We'll see if they start inching their way up from here, but the inflation story, I don't think has ended yet, which is interesting to see against consensus, yeah. right? Cause we, you look at the, uh, two year and five year break evens, and they're still pricing in that the fed within 18 months to 36 months are going to, to be able to hit their target, which seems yeah. a little optimistic, right? So it's, it doesn't seem to be priced in yet. Yeah. I, I think that that's true. Um, I also think that we're at a period where positioning is pretty extreme. So it's muddying the picture in the, in the short run, you know, I, I like to every week I take the lens back to look at, you know, a thousand or so weekly charts. And then uh, every month I like to take the lens back and look at, you know, monthly bars, uh, to see where we stand. And, and I, you know, I was doing that earlier today. And the fact is that while there's, you know, lots of stuff is pulled back, we're at higher levels in a lot of things than we were in August. While some of the most watched assets are not, you know, yeah. they, they, they got, they got still a, a pretty sloppy picture. And, and then of course, uh, Rod, you know, that I spent a lot of time on breads mm -hmm. and, um, indices can, can be very deceiving because of the makeup, uh, but breadth is not deceiving. And, uh, so I think that things are not 
right now as bad as people think. It just depends on which area of the market you're looking at, you know. So, so can you tell us a bit more about breadth and what you're seeing? Yeah. So, um, I look at, at breadth over various time frames. Uh, so simple measures like looking at various universes of securities as to what percent are trading about the 50 day moving average or what percent are moving about the 150 day moving average. Um, and again, market makes a low and then rallies pulls back to retest, you know, which groups are holding on better the second time. Um, and I look at some longer measures of breadth, uh, where we're looking at the percent of securities within a whole host of universes, asset classes, geographic regions, sectors, themes, uh, but the percent of stocks in long-term uptrends defined by a point figure chart. Uh, which I've always found useful because you can't squint at it and look at it subjectively. It's, it's pretty black and white. Um, and in most cases, um, a lot of the major market groups have much more resilient breadth right now than they did in June. Uh, and, um, and interestingly at the worst point, you know, like seven, eight days ago, the only groups that were, had not given breadth back was energy, uh, energy service, financials, which was, which was interesting. Um, and a couple of industrials groups. Now to think that, uh, financials would be hanging in and energy hanging in, and we're about to see the economy go off a cliff doesn't really, doesn't really jive. So, you know, I think that there's some important messaging when you, when you get underneath the surface and because of ETFs, and I spent a ton of time with ETFs, there probably isn't a group of securities that is more cared about from a technical perspective, but people forget the makeups of these ETFs or some of them are market cap weighted, some of them are equally weighted. And so breadth tells you a lot about what's happening underneath the surface, as opposed to the you know, the price print in the market that we see every day. And so do you see a lot of people are still focused on those FANG stocks, the growth stocks, and also, you know, some people are interested in crypto, which seem to go hand in hand. In hand. What are you seeing there in terms of prep? Yeah, it's, it's just not there. You know, it's just not there. Uh, you know, um, when I looked at it, it they, they, the breadth readings did not jump after, after the June low. And they certainly rolled over prior to the indices heading lower. So that to me is not a sign that you're going to get leadership. And I've talked to, you know, two or three different strategists on wall street who, who are of the belief that if we do resolve higher coming out of say September and October, that it'll be a rip roaring rally in the fang stocks. And, and maybe that would be the case. Like you can get those short term moves, but it sure didn't look that way when we got the weakness over the last few days, last 10 days, it just, you know, the, I think that the ARKK, uh, you know, ARK Innovation ETF Arcane. and the ARKQ very quickly went back almost to new relative lows for the year. And that's probably the octane in that as a, as a tell. So it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and you know, when, when I was in New York last week, I talked to so many folks. This is, I went to two different macro days. The, the bearishness is unbelievable. Yeah. I don't think I've yeah. ever seen so many, uh, people with conviction, ready to stand on the tallest step or the tallest, get in the tallest tree and yell about how it is that this is going to be a, just like, you know, just like 2008 or just like 2001. And, you know, it is regime change for sure. But at this point, you know, and it can always change. It doesn't look like we have some major lurking disaster. Yeah, I <laughs> saw a chart about the amount of the level of put buying in the U.S. market was at we had at levels that we hadn't seen since post 08. Right? It's always after yeah. the big crash that you get these big. It doesn't mean it doesn't indicate anything from like that. Sh the the fact that a lot of people have bought puts doesn't necessarily indicate anything, but it was just interesting to see what the sentiment is out there, and um, and so yeah. So this generally speaking, th that that fear doesn't follow with reality, right? So yeah, I'll tell you the, the, if you if you look at the um, 
this was from, from sentiment trader, but the, 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 the amount of dollars being paid in premium for puts. <laughs> that's it. That's the one. Yeah, yeah that's uh, the one. That's right. Off the charts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually multiples of what it was in 2008, nine, and certainly multiples of where we were in, in 15, 16. And, uh, so. Yeah, you yeah. guys shared it, didn't you? I think I, I think I saw Mike had shared that in. Uh, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's been a good that podcast by yeah. uh, Kem uh, or Jem, I think is his name, uh, Kasari, that um, talked through the yeah. whole thing and what's going on in the belly of the beast. So uh, worth looking him up and checking it out. Yeah. Now, now you know, to, to, not to whistle by the graveyard, right? There's lots that we got to deal with in front of us. Um, the reality is that, that QT really sort of kicks in in earnest this month. Right. Um, and it's something like 95 billion a month. And, um, and at some point, some of the stimulus that's offsetting is going to start coming out of the system. So there's things to watch, but you know, I've always had a view that if you look, if you took all of the, um, bear markets that took place especially if you look at the ones that happened sort of during secular bull markets, 18 to 23%, whether you were getting a recession or not, um, to go from sort of 25% to 45 or 50, you sort of have to have some kind of a financial crisis, like some kind of a credit event. And so we all have to be watching credit spreads and the credit spreads. I mean, you know, if you compare them over the last few years are a little elevated, but uh, you know, not elevated relative to 20 and not even close yeah. to what you saw in 2008. So if they really start to trend, okay, let's, let's look at that. And if, if volatility really starts to pick up, uh, we've been making lower highs in volatility since January, that would be another thing that you have to really care about. Um, you know, there's a lot of things we need to watch for, uh, don't get me wrong. Um, but it may just be that the economy is stronger than people are ready to give it credit for. And, uh, and reonshoring may have a, a pretty positive impact overall. Um, so there are things that we have to watch, but I, 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 th I think that the, the balance of evidence is that you should be giving benefit of the doubt, uh, to more reflationary assets than, than people are. And that's important because there's such small parts of the market. So I just want to make sure that, that I'm kind of getting your prism right, like the prism you're looking things through. So in terms of what, what you're saying is not happening is a deflationary bust that will lead all assets down at the same time, right? So we're talking about right. equities, bonds, commodities, gold. What you're saying is there is a reflationary thrust that it may not be, the leaders are not going to be the old leaders. What we're looking at is energies, certain banks, maybe so financials, you said were there. Right now, you're not seeing as much weakness there. So the change of the guard is more towards reflationary assets rather than, you know, the old guard. Um, and, um, and, and so barring a massive credit crisis that'll show up out of nowhere, we will be able to rotate into something that's going up as a long only yeah. investor. Okay. You know, look, look, you could make, you could make money in some of the most difficult markets if you found the right groups, you mm -hmm. know, and, um, you know, the reality is that, that, um, if you take, um, uh, basic materials and energy, um, uh, or just take the value camp within the S and P 500, you know, as a proxy, it's as cheap as it's ever been. Yeah. So maybe we're going to get some revisions lower in certain parts of the market. And I would certainly expect that. Um, but, um, active sort of hedge oriented managers have really front end loaded a bet that that stuff will collapse. So it's probably a lot of, you know, whatever weakness may come is, is now built into the market. Uh, it's not showing a willingness to go lower. Uh, and in fact, the surprise could be that the structural deficits that we have today that we haven't had for the last 20 years could prove to be the linchpin to give you the surprise leg higher in that stuff, especially on a relative basis to the other types of assets that you could hold. Yeah. You know, I can make a case for why if the economy slows down, you might want to hold some bonds, but I'm not seeing any sign of that in the market <laughs> when we're making new yeah. highs in yields. Yeah. Uh, 
So I remember back in, the, it's interesting because in, in the 2000s, it was a similar story, right? You saw this dispersion between value investors and growth investors in the 2000s, mid 2000s, even further. And I think a lot of that has to do, you mentioned the word duration and, and you were talking specifically about the 30 year. But if we think about duration, it also means like, when do you expect to get cash flows to pay for what you're buying today? And then growth stocks tend to have long duration, they tend to be long duration assets. And value investors tend to rotate towards real assets that have real cash flows and you know, have generally low valuation. And so during that period in the 2000s, you saw that, that, that dispersion, um, you saw energies do really well while we had, I think, a, a lost decade for a growth for the NASDAQ. Yeah. It just took forever yeah. to get back up to normal. So do we see inflation being kind of the linchpin here as well in this kind of regime change that's going to be more towards value and, and um, reflationary assets over kind of these growth-oriented securities? Well, so when we talk duration, as you say, we're talking about, you know, you can compare to like long treasuries and growth stocks. Yeah, neither one of them are paying you very much. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if you took a look at, so the last time we saw generational shift in yields was in the uh, early 1950s, right? 1950-51. And we were, came from like 1.6 in the 10-year to 6.6 .6 over the next 15 years. It took 15 years for that to take place. And you weren't even into persistent inflation by then, you know. But it, 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 so it takes a long time to build that, you know, that psyche into the market. But if you compared, if you took, took, uh, took a 10 year from 1951 to 1966, I think it generated 1.6% total return. Um, so almost exactly what inflation was smoothed out over that period. Um, if you took the same dollars and bought a basket of, uh, dividend growth stocks, you did way better than the stock market and the stock market had a secular bull market. And of course that was the run up to then nifty 50. And by 1973, 74, the nifty 50, which were dividend stocks, yeah. were trading at 70 to 90 times earnings, right? That's what can happen. If you're, if you're a bond investor, at some point you get frustrated. Maybe it's not year one, maybe it's not year two. We're all different. But people slowly, one by one, say, hey, I got to do something different. So my premise is that we're into a period of slowly ramping cycles of inflation. There's going to be lots of frustrating period for bond investors. They're going to look for some source of alternates. The traditional defensive sectors, which are doing just fine right now, we own them, like we own utilities and staples. But they're more expensive than they've ever been, right? So... Then you look across the street, there's an ETF, GUNR, and it's made up of upstream natural resource companies. So the, the big integrated oil companies and the big integrated materials, I think it pays a 3.4% dividend and it's been growing as dividend about 10%. I like their odds, mm -hmm. right? I, I mean, it's, it's inexpensive. It's, it's a, it's a great yield. It's one that could do very well. So. I think all we need to see is small amounts come from the big pile of money that's been built up in the bond market to the small pile that everybody hates, such as energy and materials and, and, and dividend payers in general. And there's a, there's a real transition that could take place over many, many years. And it's not a bad theme to focus well, on. It's a, it's a change yeah. of the guard, right? Where you yeah. have a handful of securities dominating the indices. And so we talk about the markets, quote unquote, but it's a handful of stocks dominating the indices. And you have whatever commodities was in the beginning of this year and, and relative to the weights of, of the NASDAQ. Or the it, was big like, it was like three and a half percent. Three and a half percent, right? So you had a hundred plus percent run up in that space while the NASDAQs or the, uh, the FANGs have gotten hurt. It's going to take time for that to become bigger and yeah. bigger yeah. and bigger, right? <clears throat> yeah. And I remember there was um, a stat, I can't remember the exact number, but I remember from s using kind of your historical dates, I looked at the growth rate of the economy from, or earnings growth from 1966 to 82, where the markets were flat. The Dow Jones was basically 0% yeah. annualized. It was the same as the growth rate from 82 to 97. Mm -hmm. That didn't change. What changed mm -hmm. was the multiples, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. We had a period when the 1970s, a high vol inflation volatility, which is, I think what you're talking about, inflation going up and down, up and down. When inflation volatility is high, you, you require a higher risk premium and a lower multiple. And That's then right. when inflation gets hit in 1981, Volcker breaking the back of inflation, you now have the freedom to provide higher, higher multiples to the market, right? It doesn't yeah. mean that the underlying economy isn't going to grow. And that's an interesting thing that people fail to connect. We could be in a period where the economy continues to do okay. Uh, there is going to be inflation. There's going to be nominal growth, but the multiples are going to need to, to contract, especially in overvalued stocks underneath yeah. that index, right? While yeah. other if areas are going to be growing. If you have, if you have businesses where the change in the landscape has an immediate impact, you know, so energy prices move higher next quarter, <laughs> we make more money or, or, you know, nickel prices or, or, uh, or ag prices, you know, we have an immediate impact. It's a short duration asset. It cycles back to us very, very quickly. You know, people are going to be willing to pay for that, you know, now. You might, it, the other interesting comment that Stanley Drucken Miller made last week, I thought this was a great one, was that the central bankers are like reformed smokers. <laughs> you know, not only are they quitting smoking, but they just can't stop talking about it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> right. right. Unbearable, <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> so, but let's just see what that's happens. <laughs> let's see what happens. If you do get some, you know, economic damage. They're going to go back to the same well they've used for, since, since, you know, before the financial crisis. Yeah. And so if that's the case, then, um, uh, I think we're going to continue to see bouts of, of higher inflation, uh, you know, in, in ebbs and flows, and that's going to benefit certain types of assets. And it's going to make people who've tied up their money for a long period of time, very nervous. Yeah. So do you and, think that, 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 that's what the fed is doing is, is basically, um, storing up the dry powder so that they have it when, when things go the other way? They're, they're trying to do that, but they're also trying to, by front loading and buying very, being very vociferous, uh, verbally, <laughs> they're trying to get the maximum impact with the, with the quickest, with the quickest, shortest cycle they can make it. So they don't create too much damage. And I, and I think, um, that's why we see so many Fed speakers now, you know, just in the very short run, I think last week was the end of the window where Fed speakers are out. They now in a blackout period until the next meeting. So we won't hear any more, right. any more scary talk for the next few days. But, um, that's, that's exactly what they're trying to do. And, um, you know, people are all very brave when there's no major damage right in front of them. If they see, start seeing significant economic impact. You know, we'll see who blinks. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to bet that they will, you know, the, the, especially, you know, outside the U.S., they'll keep going back to the well of, of being easier with policy. And that could be a problem longer term. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Let's, let's talk about what happens when the Fed has to blink and has to add liquidity in whatever means, you know, when we go to QT to, to QE again, or, you know, Fed fund rates going lower. What's different this time? than before when they did that? Well, what's, what's different is that, that being in a disinflationary period means that structurally we had, you know, more capacity than we needed and very quickly, you know, they could get, get what they wanted. Um, the things that we're short of today, there's no quick answer. You know, you takes too long to put a copper mine into production than it, or nickel mine. Um, it may be that part of the reason actually utilities are, are behaving as well as they are, seeing a big new source of demand coming at them from EVs. Right. Um, mm. But, but, but these waves are coming and they're not going to stop. So, um, I think it may be that it's, it's a trickier job for them and they're, they're going to have to really, uh, really manage it. And I don't think that there is the political will to take a lot of pain. Um, not in the next few months anyway. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. So, so anyway, if, 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 for instance, if when the Fed decides to really make it clear that the rates are going higher and they're going to go higher for longer, that over the next 
10 days, all you get is a 2% pullback in the Rogers commodity at that. You know, the market's kind of fading, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, or saying, okay, well, there's, there's, there's already some of this in the market. We don't think this is the place where, where we're really going to get hurt. It's the longer duration assets that have, that, that are getting hurt. So, so, it's so like the, the position you had where the fed was, was able to, to raise demand for the areas that they needed. It was easy for them, for example, uh, in during the, the 08 crisis, not easy, but they were able to pump money because what was needed was credit and lending and liquidity, right? So you're able to do that. The feds has the right tools to be able to fix that problem easily without any repercussions. Yep. The things that need fixing today is on the real economy. Right? They, yep. can't, they can't manufacture more oil. They can't manufacture more grains. This is a structural issue that now has them, whatever the tools that they have, they're limited because I, I, at least our view is that you're going to have an issue with inflation once you start adding that liquidity. You're, yes. you're just, that's the big uh, parameter that they didn't have to really deal with until recently. Yeah. And, and so that's and where the so, stickiness comes in. in. In some ways, I think, I think they're still hoping that some of this inflation is transitory in that you know, supply chains will kind of come back in and we rebuild some inventories and consumer products and so on. And so I think that that's why in general, the consumer discretionary sector has continued to be difficult. It really hasn't had a bid. One of the, I think one of the knocks against the possibility that we've tested a higher low is that we really haven't seen a lift off in the, in the consumer discretionary group. Um, so, so it may be, it may be that, that, you know, like there'll be a little bit of, uh, a little bit of pain in consumer discretionary and that would be okay, but they, they can have an impact there. They, they can't have an impact in some of these other groups, I don't think. So David, um, the transition that we're in right now, this sort of pivotal moment in time is, is, um, makes it really difficult to, you know, decide how to go forward. Do you, do you feel like you have to have, um, one foot in the past and a foot in the future and in terms of, of like how to, what positions to maintain? I mean, when you're in a position where you really don't know what, what's going to happen or the uncertainty level is so, um, you know, it's opaque, um, how do you navigate, uh, through that? I mean, you, you pick your bright spots, you pick your, your, your negative spots. Um, you know, you can do, obviously you, you can take long, short positions, uh, through your, your, your strategies. And so how do you, how do you, nav how are you navigating that right now? How are you, how are you uh, positioning yourself for, for, at just about any outcome that, that could yeah. come, come, you know, to fruition in the next couple of months? So, so Pierre, we're, we're very fortunate that, you know, we've been pretty over from the very beginning that we have a completely open mandate. Yeah. So, you know, consultants are never going to like us because, because we are never going to, you know, have a low tracking error. Um, but the way we look at it is this, um, there is a risk that things tighten up too much. And, and that generally would mean you'd want to have some defensive positions in the portfolio. And for us, I'd rather have something with a potentially growing dividend than a fixed income. So that's where we're in the, in some utilities and staples. Um, we tend to be in grossier staples and utilities, um, like a next era energy, for instance, it's got right. lots of wind and solar. Um, so that's, that's one piece. Second piece is just a solid dividend growth tranche in the portfolios. Um, and then the third leg is the more offensive positioning, which is energy, uh, and some, some basic materials, uh, manufacturers or producers. Um, we also have, uh, some direct exposure to commodities themselves, which have had lower vol than everything. Right. You know, um, so there, there's that we have, we have kept about a 12% weight in very short term bonds, which effectively are cash to us. Um, and, uh, 
and a little bit of cash, five or 6%. But what positioned that way over the last while, anytime there's an update, because we're not lugging some big parts of the market, we're getting, you know, a nicer lift than, than you would, you know, lugging the things that everybody owns. And on the downdraft days, that's been a lot better. So I think that we have to maintain flexibility. You've got one foot in the, in the dividend defense camp and one foot in the sort of inflation camp and a little bit of flexibility in the middle to, 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 to come down harder on one side or the other. Um, you know, we run stops on every one of our positions. You, we could talk right. next Tuesday and something's changed and, and our portfolios will look quite different. Um, but I think that for the last few months, we're about 2% exposed to technology, which is pretty big market call, I suppose. And, um, and almost negligible in consumer discretionary, um, and, and, and other sort of long duration assets like you know, real estate investment trust, just, just not, not there. Uh, but I think that you have to be really willing to keep looking at the data and keep saying, is, is this continuing? Is relative strength in these groups maintaining itself? Is breadth maintaining itself? Is there new leadership emerging, showing up? Um, you know, I keep, keep skeptical, you know, I, yeah. I'm, I, I sound like we're, we have this very firm view. It's not a firm view. It's just what the data is telling us to do right now. And if it changes, we'll change. Um, but I do worry because there's so many people have gone down the passive path and you can use passive tools to construct a portfolio. It doesn't right. mean you're passive. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of people who just, you know, have been convinced that they, if they pay the lowest fee and they own the broad a broad index, <laughs> nothing can go wrong. Yeah. Time frames, well, we, time frames vary. Yeah. We just talked about it, right? They don't know the unintended bets that they're making with their passive investment. And we could go back right. to the Nortel years and yeah. what percentage of the index was Nortel at the peak. Uh, was that a, a thoughtful, well-diversified passive index? I would say probably not likely. And <laughs> having the concentration in growth stocks that we've seen up until 2020, well, not 2021, is probably not diversified, right? So that's a good, it's a question that I have. Do you see a bigger role for active in the next 10 years than we've seen in the last 10 years? Is, is, this, a, is this a decade of vindication for active management versus just raise well, your sales and participate in growth? Okay, so let's, let's say there's two, there's two potential outcomes, two major potential outcomes. The one that I've, the, I believe the market is telling us right now, which is we've seen a regime change to a reflationary environment. Uh, and it just may be, there are different groups that do well. And if you've ever looked at it over time, like energy as a percent of the S and P has had wild fluctuations over time and we're coming off sort of secular mm -hmm. lows recently. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so I think that, that, um, if you position in some of these sectors, you can still be a pretty sturdy investor and hold them longer term and, and do very well. And we could be remaining in a structural bull market in equities. That's a possibility. Second possibility. Um, maybe it is that we're ending a secular bull market for equities as we know them after only 10, 10 or 12 years it would be short. And the, and the, the, the ultimate trajectory of the bull market will have been under what has been most secular bull markets. But even during secular bear markets, you've been able to do very well by picking your spots. So when I say active, it may be that we, you own a portfolio that's fully invested most of the time, but just doesn't look like the index. Yeah. Or it might be that you're quite tactical and you're invested over two, three year periods and, and sitting on your hands for 18 months in between. Either one could be the, could, could be a possibility. Uh, I think, you know, the biggest risk that we see is a contraction in liquidity in the market as you have QT taking liquidity out. Um, as you, if, if uh, governments were to get a little bit more constrained in their spending, and if the banks don't see deposit growth and can't have the kind of loan growth that we've seen over the last few years, I think last year, uh, there was something like, uh, 500 billion in loan growth in the U S and this year, there's been something like 80 billion in loan growth. 
So <laughs> there's less liquidity for sure. Yeah. Um, and if that's the case, it might be that we have to pick our spots and be less invested at certain times. But is that but, not priced in already in the markets? Is It's not nothing new that the Fed's going to do QT and that no. all this tightening is happening. It no. might already be there, right? Yeah. I, and, and, that's, and that's why I think that's why I think that some of these groups are acting as well as they are, because despite all the things that we're worried about, you know, they won't go down more. Yeah, um, exactly. So, so again, it's gonna, it's, it has to be that investors ha just have to be prepared to, to, to pick their spots. Mm -hmm. And so going back to your original question, I think that we have set up a great opportunity for active managers. And when everybody's leaned to one side as they were in 1999 or, or as they were last year, it creates opportunity. And uh, you just have to be willing to say that the world has changed, uh, and, and recognize it and do something about it. Yeah. I tend to agree with that. I think the, the decade from 2000 to 2010 even was a pretty fantastic time for active yeah. management because you had that change of the guard, lots of sector rotation. The areas that worked were uh, unorthodox areas for most of the world, maybe less so in Canada because energies and uh, commodities did fairly well in the mid nots, yeah. right? And through, <laughs> I, I think we were the first to bottom after, I think the commodities bottom in December of 08 before the broad equity markets did. So yeah. that was a good time to be different. Uh, yeah. And then it was bad to be different. Diversification and uh, yeah. and thoughtful, you know, trend, tactical bets was a bit tough when the only game in town was growth. Mm -hmm. Now we're starting to see a bit of the value, I guess. Well, the, the, this is kind of where Belsky was saying that, you know, there's really no analog for what we've been through the last couple of years. There's, you know, even, even if you go back to, you know, Spanish flu a hundred years ago, uh, or a little bit more than a hundred years ago, there, there's, there's, that's not a proper analog because we made it through the pandemic because of technology, largely, largely owing to technology. Um, but we don't even know where we are right now. You know, like we, we, there's, there's so little to go on other than, you know, the data that's coming and so much of it is backward looking and and, uh, you know, all we have is what everybody's talking about on an ongoing basis, which is, you know, supply chain disruptions and, uh, you know, reshoring, um, supply chains being, you know, broken, basically. Um, the, the, um, I think one of the most interesting things that I read recently was from, uh, was war, war and, uh, industrial policy by Zoltan Pozar. Um, was really well written. I mean, really, really well uh, written about you know the the chasm that it has opened up between the two sort of main power blocks, which are you know he labeled as uh, you know China and America, Chimerica and Europe and Russia. Eurasia are are you know both in tatters right now. That that you know that that also too adds to the the great uncertainty that we're faced with right now is not knowing where, you know, even geopolitical situations will go or how, how that'll affect trade. But I, 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 I like the, uh, I have to say that, that, you know, in all of that mess, there are the things that can't be fixed easily, which is what we've been talking about, mm -hmm. like energy and commodities and metals, um, that drive, you know, the, the shift that we're seeing to, towards, you know, electrification, for example, and, and, uh, you know, the, the problems that they're having in Europe right now, that's, that's going to take a very long time to fix. And, um, I liked your, your update, David, uh, several weeks ago where, where you, you know, you brought up, uh, tourmaline and, and vermilion and, uh, you know, as, as, um, really strong plays in the, in the, you know, at least in the LNG and natural gas area, um, tourmaline with its tie up with Chenier, uh, you know, but, but what, 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 what's really interesting about that is that those deals are 2025, 26, 27, you know, yeah. they're so far they're away out that they're out yeah, there. Like, you know, no one's, no one's thinking of, of, you know, how do we get more gas in Europe in 2026? They, they are. Yeah. Um, but 
you know, right now that's not a quick turnaround. You know, that's, that's, uh, you know, with, with the Nord Stream pipeline disruption, that, that's, that's a long way to go before you solve that problem in Europe. Yeah. And, and so there are some, some interesting, very sticky plays that, that you can focus on without knowing, without actually knowing what's going to happen with the economy or with the, right. you know, the situation here. Well, and, and so here's another thing that's interesting to think about. So there probably isn't a greater, more consensus trade than the, than the strong dollar. Yeah. Right. I mean, nobody wants to fight that because it's kind of gone parabolic. Um. You know, if you think about what a change might mean there. So we've always thought that a strong dollar is really, really tough on uh, basic materials and commodities, yet they're holding in remarkably well against a very strong dollar. You look at uh, some of the international markets, like Japan is really interesting right now because there's a market that's been out of favor, you know, for 40 years. It's gone nowhere, <laughs> uh, but has been remarkably resilient this year. And, you know, yes, the, the central bank's been quite easy with policy there, but that's interesting. And that, that, that's one international market's interesting. India is very interesting right now. I mean, yeah. they're, you know, um, they're growing very nicely and, and, uh, lots of positive things happening there, probably benefiting from inexpensive Russian oil. Um, yeah. You know, um, probably uh, yeah. Brazil, <laughs> Brazil <laughs> looks explicitly, right? <laughs> Brazil certainly looking better, um, the last while. No, those, those markets probably shouldn't be doing well with a strong dollar, right? Should be pressure on them. Yeah, exactly. Like India. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, that's sort of something interesting to watch because I always like to I always like to see what's behaving in a way that doesn't make sense what, with what's going on in the rest of the world. I think you have to listen, to, listen to, to China and Russia a little bit when they talk about, you know, moving away from U.S. dollar transactions. That's, it's not irrelevant. And, and that could, that could have some implications for the way things work around the world. Um, so if, if, um, if, if everybody isn't right in using the U S dollar as a safety trade, right. Then there could be interesting implications on the other side of that. But, yeah. but look, I mean, I think we need to disaggregate the U S dollar as a safety trade and the U S dollar during a prolonged inflationary regime, right? We, we don't have to go far to see that, uh, during the 2000 uh, correction or a bear market. You yeah. did see the U dollar, um, occasionally pop up as a protector, but. I'm just thinking, I'm remembering back to the U.S. Canadian exchange and how Canadian dollar appreciated 40% from 2003 to 2007, right? right? So th there's definitely, because the pain goes to the U.S. consumer as they're importing, um, they're importing goods, right? As yep. the U.S. dollar, you know, th that's just going to weaken the economy in certain areas. And, and so it's going to be a lot, I can definitely see a period where economies and third world countries that have something to export to start gaining against the U.S. dollar, not to mention the headwinds that we're seeing for the U.S. dollar from the perspective of having frozen Russian assets of these quote unquote reserve currency. Right. I mean, that's going to, that's going to cause some long-term uh, structural issues with the U.S. The reserve currency as well. So there's a couple of things in there that make it interesting to watch. Yeah. And so, and so, I mean, just think about how unproductive global markets have been, especially developing markets, you know, going, going back to 2008. Mm -hmm. Um, that's 14 years. That's, you know, that's not out of the realm of a, a typical structural bear market. Um, it's also not different than what we've seen in commodity markets. You know, we could be setting up for a different type of market outside the U S just like we are as North American investors looking at North American investments. You yeah. Know, it's it, been a it, while because as an international diversified manager, you probably haven't gotten paid much to be thoughtfully diversified into those spaces. Mm -hmm. No, no. Uh, but certain parts of Asia are looking interesting. Uh, you know, certain parts of South America are, are interesting. You know, there are lots of countries that got started tightening before the U S did and may well come out the other side a little quicker. 
So that's, that's also, I think, something that as investors, we have to be prepared to look at, even though, you know, I, you know, you remember a time, every time China rallied after the big run up into 2000, uh, 2007, people said, oh, it's back on again. Well, you know, it's failure after failure after failure. And I'm not saying China is the place that you want to look at, but there are other international markets where people have just stopped looking. And, uh, you know, not the least of which is, is, is Japan. Japan. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The the, the widow maker. Yeah. I mean, I own, I own that DXJ Japan edged, uh, hedged equity, uh, ETF. And if you look at monthly, the monthly bars, you know, going back to, you know, I think it launched in 2006, it was in a, in a horizontal range from 2006 through 2021. And if you look at the Nikkei, it's in a horizontal range since 1991. It looks, it looks pretty interesting. Yeah, it I agree. Pretty interesting. And they also, the policy makers are less restricted with, versus, you know, the yeah. UK, the U S Canada, I mean, they can, they have a lot more room to, um, to stimulate there yeah. than anywhere else. So it is definitely an interesting, it's, it's, it's the best of the worst right now. Right. Yeah. And they seem yeah. to be in good shape there. Gordon, what do you, what do you, what do you think when you speak to people, what is the, what is the most out of consensus? uh, possibility that you see. So the most out of consensus possibility, I mean, it's, um, there's the, I mean, I, I, if we agree that consensus is the fed's going to pivot and and we're going to be fine. and going to go through the roof from here and like pivot within weeks. I feel like that's the consensus. Um, I guess Rosie, and Raul Powell had a, a discussion there that talked about rates. So in contrast to us, um, you, they're seeing that bonds are the by far the best bet, that inflation's over. We're going to go back to old lows. Hmm. And, um, and that's because it's all been priced in. You know, the market is forward looking. It's seeing the, the pain and, um, and inflation's going to be handled and the Fed's going to pivot and it's going to be off to the races again. So that's kind of an interesting, like number one, that th- it's going to be, the bond's going to go higher because the Fed's going to go too high too long. They're all behind mm-hmm. the curve as they normally were. They talked about how the fact that uh, Europe raised in, in August of 2008, right kind of at the teeth of this thing because they were worried about inflation. They're seeing a parallels there. And so they're going to cause this bond spike, bond price spike that then going to lead for them to pivot and then we're back to normal. So that's kind of, for me, against consensus. What are you seeing? It, it, well, the only, the only thing about that is that, I mean, his typically the way markets might move is you'd get a, you'd get a, a high in yields and then maybe you'd make a lower high and fail to make a new high, except really across the curve, we've just, just recently made, you know, h- higher highs starting with the two year and now all the way out to the 30 year. And so I, 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 I question that one. I, I, I feel like the market's telling us something actually, you know, quite different. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I saw, like, I think that the interview date was when, um, when yields started to come down aggressively recently. Right. But they, right. they pop right back up is the problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, that to me is, is, uh, I think that, that, I think that's out of consensus. I think, I think what's out of consensus is that yields can actually be higher and stickier for longer. And, yeah. um, and, um, you know, it's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be tough. You know, they say, don't fight the fed and the fight feds, feds going to be moving away from $95 billion of treasuries <laughs> monthly. Is that, um, is that, is that, would you say that's mostly fueled by hope, you know, where, where, yeah. um, you know, investors holding long bonds are, are hoping so much that, that the Fed pivots and, and rates, you know, rates come yeah. back down. I think it's, I think it's 40 years of failed rallies in yields. Yeah. You know, and as a result, every time yields rallied, the best thing to do was to fade it. And, um, in effect, you're buying the dips in bonds. And, um, uh, and I think that people executed on that when we, when, we, when we broke through the 200 week moving average in June, 
uh, on the yield index. Um, you know, the, the moving average for yields was still moving lower. And so it's unlikely at that point you rally much above a downward sloping, very long-term moving average without coming back and tracing along it a bit. And, and so though we did that, uh, for four months, but here we are now moving away again and, 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 and basically taking out the highs. I think, I think that was a failed, a failed by the dip. And if you get enough of that, it can, you know, you could, you could, you could see it move away for longer. So I, I think that that's, I think that's a not consensus. I think that more consensus is yields will start to come down. Growth stocks will have a big recovery. Yeah. That's uh, it. And, uh, and that's why, and because they're, because the growth is pretty consistent, you know, it's a safer bet. And so that's why hedge funds have, have more concentration and big name tech than they, they did, you know, even a year ago. Yeah, I, I agree. And then the, the question is, you know, what changes that? And I think, like you said, a longer downwards, um, uh, or I guess upward spike in yields. Yeah. Persistent upward spike, or at least sideways. And, and we maintain that level for much longer. Cause that's when yeah. you really start seeing pain, you start seeing pain in housing, right? Like we are at a point, uh, home builders need uh, three to 4% yields in order to be adding inventory to, to housing prices that, that, to minimize the cost of housing. Right. And right now it's at six, 6.5, which is where we're at right now. It was a yeah. reprieve there and they thought, okay, maybe we can start getting back into it, but without yields much lower, uh, you're not going to see home builders come back in and, and an already tight inventory, both in Canada, and the United States. And so that's another price pressure that's, that's going to ma be maintained higher for longer, right? Mm -hmm. And it takes a while for home builders to finally accept that rates are at a new high before they start building up again. So all these are, it's just small frictions everywhere yeah. that are going to lead to this kind of stickiness and, and problematic inflationary uh, yeah. regime. I, um, I, I just, it just strikes me that it strikes me that going back to the well on the things that I've worked for 40 years is going to be problematic. And, you know, lots of people did that as growth stocks rolled over in 2000, it took a long time for, for, for that group to kind of find a footing and have any kind of sustainable rally. Mm -hmm. And so similarly, I think people that are buying dips and in long duration assets could be disappointed for a while. And, and it, it certainly feels counterintuitive after many, many years of disappointments to, to, to be sticky holding energy and, and, uh, uh, you know, even, even financials, you know, the U S banks only just last year broke out, uh, to new highs versus 2008 and, uh, and, you know, did pull back certainly in the, in the sell off through the winter. But that could surprise me because I think consensus is in financials that it's still sort of a crappy asset to own. Um, but they're acting pretty well over the course of the summer. U.S. Yeah. banks and U.S. Yeah. And, US and banks, even more yeah. so U.S. investment banks. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's you other know, companies outside of tech to finance, right? Yeah. yeah. That are making That's a lot true. of money. That's a good point. Right? That's a good point. I mean, the CapEx yeah. in, in anything that was ESG uh, was at all time historical lows, and that's changing in a heartbeat for obvious reasons, right? Yeah. Uh, you have the uh, Biden administration basically saying to American energy companies, you'd better buy all the inventory and lithium ion batteries that you can around the world get some money and we're going to, we're going to help you finance that. So there's, there's a lot to invest in right now. And again, yep. what I'm seeing is all within the energy space. So, uh, or, you know, anything that has to do with commodities. So that's where the money's going in. That's where the investment, the seed investors as messages are coming in and you can see, uh, North American companies benefiting from that tremendously in ways that they haven't in the last 10 years. Right. I think the CapEx yeah. expenditure number is going to grow from here. It's just going to take a while. Again, it's going to take a while. It's opportunity to yep. be made and it's going to be a bit of a tight market from here, which means, you know, you're probably going to see some continued upward pressure in prices yeah. until that inventory comes in. So yeah. David, David, what are your thoughts on, on what, what do you see as, um, being the alternative to traditional fixed income today, like the uncorrelated 
alternative to fixed income. What, what do investors do right now that are holding, that are still, let's say, holding, you know, 30 or 40 percent in, in uh, traditional fixed income? Where do, where do you go from there? I know earlier you said that, you know, you see some some shift towards uh, dividend growers, uh, dividend growth stocks as a source of fixed income, uh, but also growth. But at the same time, aren't you just increasing the uh, equity correlation in your portfolio by doing that? Is there, you know, do you yeah. have any thoughts on 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 what to do uh, instead with fixed income, or rather than trying to make a tactical bet that that long term yields will drop? You know, that long term yields will yeah will go back to uh, you know their their mean. It's, it's a it's a great question because. Um, for many years, a lot of the alternatives to pure fixed income were ultimately driven by the same things. So, you know, private credit ultimately driven by the same things. Um, so I think, I think that there's some interesting camps. I think, you know, uh, I don't think it's things like REITs. Um, I think same thing. It's, that's an asset that's, that's fueled by falling interest rates. We've done some unusual things, you know, I, I, you mentioned at the beginning that we're, we're always, we at Verona are always focused on trying to find structural revaluations. And one of the assets that we've been focused on over the last four years, uh, and, and continue to be as, as, um, music copyrights. Um, huh. we, we, we've been buying catalogs of uh, songwriters credits, songwriters copyrights. I think we own six of the top 10 stream songs in history now. Um, but we own that <laughs> uh, big catalogs by people like the weekend and so on. But yeah. what's interesting about it is, is that, you know, streaming's growing at 15% a year. Uh, the royalty rates are set. Um, the, the, as if you have good, good, uh, good assets, they generate cash on cash. I think we're generating about 8%. Cash on cash has nothing to do with the economy, has nothing to do with the stock market. Um, and yeah. uh, if, if you compare that to other long life assets, that's a pretty nice growing, growing cash flow. So, you know, it's not liquid and people are putting money away say, for five what years. What type of liquidity would, would there be right now in that space? <laughs> yeah, it's, well, I mean, it is actually a very liquid space right now. In fact, our first fund, we wound up getting a, an over the top, quite amazing bid after two years and got about a hundred percent lift. Um, but, um, I think, that, you know, assets can sell very, very quickly. They are becoming financialized. Um, you know, Apollo, BlackRock, KKR have all joined that space. And, uh, I think it's very early days for that because, because, you know, if you were to compare that against the yield on a pipeline or a toll road or a, or a, or a, or, or private credit, it's, you know, very high yields for pretty predictable, you know, pretty predictable assets. Um, but yeah, I think you have to be looking for something that will have a rising stream of cash flow because, you know, it's fixed to your point is not going to do it. <clears throat> and so, you know, we focused on, you know, the, the, the people who I know have really done well over time of own businesses with a rise, rising stream of earnings. And, um, and this is a s similar sort of thing. I think that we need that if we think that longer term, we're going to have higher and higher ebbs and flows in, in rates. It's very interesting. Yeah. Anything else that, that, uh, that you see as being suitable alternatives to consider to, uh, get some of that fixed income money back to work? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that you have, to, you do have to think that, um, it will be cyclical, you know, with, there will be ebbs and flows and you can be tactical in picking your yeah. spots. We just don't think it's yet. And so that's why the only fixed income that we have is sort of a year, 18 months in duration. And really it's a place to hold cash and keep, stay flexible. <coughs> I think that you're fighting the tide longer term to, to be there. And, uh, and you know, when, when, when I started in the investment business in the, in the mid eighties, you know, people love to have, have, have some short term cash available and, you know, more or less money market. Because if you got, if you got rising rates, you're going to get a, you know, you're going to get the, the pickup and yield more quickly. And you just might have a little bit more of that from time to time. And then, 
if if uh, if the data really rolled over and you 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 saw a response in the bond market, well, then you could take advantage of a tactical trade. But I just don't see us holding a, a static list of portfolio, a static list of fixed income, anytime soon. Are you uh, are you employing any options strategies or we, um, shorts? Of we any we kind? we don't tend to, although you know because premiums are a little bit better. Um, you know, you can, you can certainly be writing some calls, but again, that's, that's not really our focus. Uh, you know, I, I think that there are places that you can get a nice stream of income, uh, without it, <clears throat> without it being tied to the bond market. You know, I think about times in the past where we did very well owning things like West Shore terminals or Labrador iron ore, uh, that, that paid us a lot in distributions, but they're variable, you know, that's why I like some of the, so the, uh, upstream commodity company dividend payers because, you know, they'll pay out special dividends when the pricing is there. But again, it's for active, it's as an active investor. It's not, I'm not sure you can buy them to put them away and, and hope for the best. Right. Amen. So a tricky <laughs> time for investors. And it's, um, I, I think it's, it's a time when you, you want to try and understand what's happened over time and in other cycles and don't get too caught up in what's happened in the course of your, your own investing life, because for the most part that, that could be problematic, uh, over yeah. the next few years. This is so, where your instincts might, might fail you is uh, I think the key thing, Yeah, right? Your instincts have told you one thing for yeah. 40 years of your life or whatever, however long your investment career has been. And it's time to, you know, pause and reflect a little bit see what, uh, why, one of the key things I keep hearing is when will markets go back to normal? Equities and bonds are correlated. <laughs> and I keep saying, this is a normal market. You just, yeah. you're not looking at it through the right secular lens. Um, and we're going where this is part, part of a, of a normal secular market cycle and you need to study your history to know what to do in that, in that regime. So right. yeah, definitely you know, I mean, instincts I are out the window a little bit here. I mean, listen, I, we couldn't be more different than the folks at Berkshire Hathaway, but in some ways uh, we think in a similar way. And that is there are opportunities in every market. It just might be, might not be, you know, buying an index and hoping for the best, you know, there's, there's great values in this market and there's, there's parts of this market that are just not owned by anybody or very few. And, um, you know, they're going to go through big ebbs and flows. And if you can buy, you know, great businesses at four or five times earnings and get paid along the way, that's, that's pretty attractive. Whether or not, you know, it's been a good place to be for the last 15 years, it may be a good place to be for the next 15 years. But, you know, you look at companies like, you know, Rio Tinto or, or tech resources, you know, you get into a cycle, they wind up being 10 baggers. And, um, you can't forget that, um, they can cost you a lot of money if you're long through a bad period. And so you've got to be very disciplined about, you know, managing your risk and setting stops. But, um, there's, there's, there's going to be lots of opportunities going forward. It just not, might not be the ones that people have been focused on the last few years. So David, you asked Rodrigo, uh, a little while ago, what he thought was the most contrarian, um, contrarian bet in the market right now. And, um, so I, I want to ask you, what, what do you think is the most contrarian bet? The weekend, you know? uh, albums. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. thought that is was that, over, Is that contrarian or is that just, coming in? <laughs> is that just, is that just, uh, or is that just smart? <laughs> just, you know, real assets and certainly not consensus, you know, art. I mean, you know, you could say that about art as well, right? I mean, you could, you could, you, you could, except it doesn't pay you every month. That's true. You know, yeah. uh, you know, that, that, I mean, here's the, neat thing about, here's the neat thing about music is that it used to be that, you know, an artist or a songwriter got paid by the publisher and they relied on the publisher to be truthful with them as to how many units that they sold and, and, right. uh, you know, how many records they pressed. Uh, today streaming is just a world of big data. You know, you get incredibly granular data on every play of every song in every major market every day. Uh, and so when you look at a catalog, you know, exactly from the day it was, you know, used in the first place, you know, what the plays are. Yeah. And, um, so that's, it's, it's really, it's just a, it's, you just use quantitative analysis to make your decisions. 
Have you and, managed to uh, have you, have you managed to buy any of your um, lifelong favorite bands, songbooks? <laughs> well, we've it's it's been more popular music, uh, current yeah. popular music, and then uh, we have the, the partners that we have in that business were the two fellows that ran SoCan here in Canada, which is the Canadian Songwriters Guild, and so they have or that they managed the relationships with every Canadian artist going back over the last 40 years and, and fortunately have, you know, personal relationships with them and know who's willing to sell and who, who isn't. And more specifically, the songwriters, you know, Toronto happens to be the epicenter for popular music in the world because the really? songwriters for the weekend are writing for Dua Lipa and writing for the Chainsmokers and writing for, you know, any, any other, um, <laughs> long list of musicians. And it's the songwriters who get paid. And if the songwriters yeah. get paid. And the best part about it is a great song always gets re-recorded at some point by somebody else and you get paid on that too. Or it gets put into a movie and you get paid on that too. Yeah. Or it goes into a video game and you get paid on that too. So those are, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's a very interesting thing, but you, you take the same quantitative analysis uh, to work there as you would, as you would in a, a, a portfolio of securities. Uh, did you get in on that Stranger Things Kate Bush rush? <laughs> no, <laughs> we, we did not, we did not, we did not, No, but, uh, anyway, I, it, it's a, it's going to be an interesting world as we go forward here. And, and, uh, certainly there's going to be lots of surprises. And I think that that's why we all have to keep our eyes open and just have a process to use to, to, to understand what the market's telling us, not, not to, to say, this is what I hope the market does. And, and keep some powder dry. And keep some powder dry. That never sure. hurts. Never hurts. Yeah. So, um, David, one last question, um, what's a hobby or an interest, personal interest of yours that you could talk about for hours besides investing? <laughs> well, I, I, um, uh, I'm a bit of a, uh, sports fanatic. I say, you know, I need to do something every day. Yeah. So I came back, I came back yesterday from the U S open. And, uh, All right. Amazing. I, I'm a, I'm a, a bit of a racket sports fanatic, whether it's tennis or, or paddle, which is one of the hottest growing sports in the world now, uh, it came out of Spain or double squash. Uh, I think that, I think that you gotta have other interests in your life and, uh, having one that's active is a, is, is a pretty big one and, and can you know, keep you entertained all the time. Excellent. Yes. Well, David, it looks like we lost Rod. Um, here he is. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Sometimes Pierre. stuff that came around there. Like, came in. Yeah, my computer be. didn't like what you were saying, David. <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you so much. That was uh, that was a terrific discussion. Um, and you know, as we said, there's so much to uh, talk about and think about right now. It's uh, it's, it's a terribly uh, unpredictable uh, market that we're in a pivotal moment, transitional moment. Um, I think we could have continued talking because I, I, I certainly had a few more questions, but maybe we can leave that for another, another, uh, uh, episode. Guys, I really appreciate you having me and, and, uh, I'd love to come back again at some point. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. We'd love Dave. to have you. Great to see you again. Hey, take it easy guys.